3. The philosophy of self-consciousness. The real leader of the young Hegelians in Berlin was not Kirpen, however, but Bruno Bauer, who was officially recognized as an orthodox pupil of the master. Particularly as he had shown great speculative arrogance in an attack on Strauss' Life of Jesus, a proceeding which earned him a vigorous rebuff from Strauss. Bauer enjoyed the protection of the Minister of Culture Ortenstein, who regarded him as a very promising and talented young man. However, Bruno Bauer was not a careerist and Strauss turned out to be a poor prophet when he declared that Bauer would end his days in the petrified scholasticism of the orthodox chieftain Hengst and Beck. On the contrary, in the summer of 1839 Bauer came to grips with Hengst and Beck who wanted to present the God of the Old Testament, the God of anger and vengeance, as the God of Christianity. The literary exchanges which resulted remained well within the limits of an academic polemic but they were sufficiently sharp to cause the decrepit and very much alarmed Altenstein to remove his protégé from the suspicious glare of the orthodox who were as vengeful as they were Simon Pure. In the autumn of 1839 he sent Bauer to the University of Bonn as a lecturer with the intention of appointing him to a professorship before the end of the year, but Bruno Bauer, as his letters to Marx indicate, was already in a period of intellectual development which was to take him far beyond Strauss. He began a criticism of the Gospels which finally demolished the last ruins which Strauss had left still standing. He contended that there was not an atom of historical truth in the Gospel story, that everything in it was the product of fantasy, and that Christianity as a world religion was not forced on the classic Greek or Roman world, but that it was the natural product of that world. With this development he took the one path which offered a possibility of scientifically investigating the origin of Christianity and it is not without good reason that our contemporary, the fashionable court and salon theologian Harnack, who is at the moment engaged in furbishing up the Gospels in the interests of the ruling classes, roundly abuses any attempt to proceed along the path opened up by Bruno Bauer. Whilst these ideas were beginning to mature in Bruno Bauer's head Karl Marx was his inseparable companion and Bauer recognized his friend, nine years his junior, as a most capable brother in arms. He had hardly settled down in Bonn when he began to try to persuade Marx to follow him. A club of professors in Bonn was simple Philistinism compared with the Hegelian club in Berlin, he declared. The latter had at least always been a center of intellectual interests. There was also plenty of amusement in Bonn too, what they called amusement there, though he had laughed more crossing the street with Marx in Berlin than he ever had in Bonn. Marx should just polish off his trivial examination, after all only Aristotle, Spinoza, Leibniz and nothing else were required, and stop caking such farcical nonsense seriously, he would find the Bonn philosopher's easy game, and above all, a radical publication was necessary, one they could issue jointly, for the Berlin chit-chat of the Hallish Jarbuka was no longer tolerable, he felt sorry for Uhe, but why on earth didn't the fellow drive the vermin out of his paper, Bauer's letters sound revolutionary enough at times but it is always a philosophical revolution he has in mind and he was far more inclined to count on the support of the state than on its hostility. He had hardly written to Marx in December, 1839, that Prussia seemed destined to make progress only on account of its genus, though naturally such battles need not always be fought over a hecatom of corpses, when a few months later, following on the almost simultaneous decease of his protector Altenstein and the old king, he pledged himself to the highest idea of our state life, the family spirit of the princely house of Hohenzollern which had devoted four centuries of high-minded effort to the settlement of the relations of church and state. At the same time Bauer promised that science would not falter in its defense of the state idea against the usurpation of the church, the state might err. It might become suspicious of science and use the weapon of intimidation, but reason belonged too innately to the state for it to err long. The new king answered this homage by appointing the orthodox reactionary Eichhorn as Altenstein's successor, and Eichhorn immediately proceeded to sacrifice the freedom of science. As far as it was connected with the state idea, that is to say, the freedom of academic teaching, to the usurpation of the church. Politically considered, Bauer was far less reliable than Kirpen. Kirpen might have made a mistake about one Hohenzollern who surprisingly rose above the general family level, but was not likely to make any mistake concerning the family spirit of that princely house. Kirpen was by no means so thoroughly at home with the Hegelian ideology as was Bauer, but it must not be overlooked that the latter's political short-sightedness was only the reverse side of his philosophical acumen. He discovered in the Gospels the intellectual deposit of the period in which they had originated. He was of the opinion, 
and considered from a purely ideological standpoint it was not illogical, that if even the Christian religion with its turbid ferment of Greek or Roman philosophy had succeeded, in overcoming the culture of the classic world, then the clear and free criticism of modern dialectics would succeed still more easily in shaking off the incubus of Christian Germanic culture, it was the philosophy of self-consciousness which gave him such inspiring confidence. The Greek philosophic schools which developed from the national disintegration of Greek life and did most to fructify the Christian religion, the Skeptics, the Epicureans and the Stoics, had united under this name. They could not be compared with Plato in speculative depth nor with Aristotle in universal knowledge, and they had been somewhat contemptuously treated by Hegel. Their common aim was to make the individual, separated by a terrible cataclysm from everything which heretofore had stayed and fortified him, independent of everything outside himself, to lead him back into his inner life, to seek his real happiness in the peace of the mind, a peace which might remain unshaken whilst the whole world was collapsing around his ears. However, declared Bauer, on the ruins of a vanished world the emaciated ego feared itself as the only power, it estranged and alienated its own consciousness by representing its own general power as an alien power outside itself, in the Lord and Master of the Gospel story who overcame the laws of nature with one breath of his mouth, subjugated his enemies and announced himself even on earth as the Lord of the world and the judge of all things, it created a hostile brother, but still a brother, to the world ruler in Rome holding sway over all rights and carrying the power over life and death on his lips. Under the slavery of the Christian religion, however, humanity was trained so that it might prepare itself all the more thoroughly for freedom and encompass it all the more completely when it should finally be one. The eternal consciousness of self, realizing itself, understanding itself and comprehending its own essence, had power over the products of its own alienation. If we brush aside the typical phraseology current in the philosophic language of the day we can express in simpler and more understandable terms what it was that attracted Bauer, Kirpen and Marx to the Greek philosophy of self-consciousness, here too they were in reality again picking up the threads of the bourgeois enlightenment movement. The old Greek philosophic schools of self-consciousness produced no one comparable to the geniuses of the old natural philosophy, Democritus and Heraclitus, or of the later abstract philosophy, Plato and Aristotle, but nevertheless they played a great historic role, they opened up new and wider horizons to the human intellect and they broke down both the national limitations of Hellenism and the social limitations of slavery limitations which neither Plato nor Aristotle had dreamed of overstepping, they greatly fructified primitive Christianity, which was the religion of the oppressed and the suffering, and which did not go over to Plato and Aristotle until it had become the religion of an oppressing and exploiting power, although generally speaking Hegel treated the philosophy of self-consciousness in a very offhand fashion. Even he expressly pointed out the great significance of the inner freedom of the individual amidst the utter calamity of the Roman world empire which effaced all the nobility and beauty of spiritual individuality with a brutal hand. The bourgeois enlightenment movement of the 18th century revived the Greek philosophies of self-consciousness, the doubts of the skeptics, the hatred the Epicureans bore towards religion, and the republican sentiments of the Stoics. In his work on Frederick the Great, whom he regarded as one of the heroes of the Enlightenment movement, Kirpin sounded the same note when he declared, Epicureanism, Stoicism and Skepticism represent the nerves, muscles and intestinal system of the antique organism, their direct and natural unity determined the beauty and morality of classical antiquity, which collapsed when the latter died out. Frederick the Great adopted all three and wielded them with wonderful power, they became the chief factors in his world outlook, in his character and in his whole life. Marx was at least prepared to grant that what Kirpin said here concerning the relation of the three philosophies to Greek life possessed a deeper significance. The problem which occupied his older friends occupied Marx no less, but he dealt with it in a different fashion. He sought human self-consciousness as the supreme godhead, tolerating no other gods before it, neither in the distorting mirror of religion nor in the philosophic dilettantism of a despot. He went back to the historical origins of this philosophy whose systems represented for him as well the key to the real history of the Greek spirit.